Welcome back to the Mom and Mind Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kat. On our episode today, we are joined by Kate Statham. She is a licensed clinical social worker and mother of two with lived experience of perinatal trauma, depression, and anxiety. Kate is talking about her experience of her daughter, Claire, being diagnosed with a congenital diaphragmatic hernia at 36 weeks gestation and how the trauma of that diagnosis impacted her and the subsequent pregnancy and traumatic birth that followed, let alone the six weeks that followed Claire's birth. She shares with us what her experience was like in those weeks before and after delivery, as well as what it was like for her husband in part. Experiencing the trauma related to her daughter's diagnosis while in utero, then enduring a birth that was traumatizing, and the following weeks after delivery, which also brought their own traumas. She is sharing this in part to, one, let people know that people aren't alone when they find out that their child has a diagnosis in utero, and also to give hope to people and give them something to hold on to so that they know that they can get through something like this, even though it seems impossible. For those of you who have experienced a congenital abnormality in utero or even learned of a diagnosis after delivery, just gauge for yourself if Um, listening to the details of Kate's experience is something that you're uh, ready for, or if you'd like to come back at another time. And although Kate's story and Claire's story are really difficult and in some ways difficult to hear, as we know from stories like hers and stories on this podcast, the more that we know about these things, know that they can happen and understand that people do make it through and get to the other side and find some sort of healing, the better off we all are because it can be really hard when times are difficult to even fathom how you're going to get through something. And Kate did. And I'm so glad she came to share this with us. So let's meet Kate. Welcome, Kate. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here today. Um, I'm grateful to you that you're coming on to share your experience, um, you know, and other people will probably know that this, these kinds of things are not talked about enough, um, people's challenges and what it really feels like and is like to, to deal with things like this. So yeah, please do, um, start wherever you'd like with your story. Okay, sure. So thank you so much. Um, so I got pregnant with my first child, my daughter, Claire, and throughout the pregnancy, things were pretty good. I was feeling honestly, like overall great. Like I was having the glow that people Mm -hmm. say you experience. Nothing was going wrong. Even the aches and pains weren't there. Um, I went in to the diabetic screening. So I got, you know, all the way there, which is what usually around 28 to 32 weeks pregnant. And um, I did the one hour test and that didn't go so well. So they had me come back for the fun three hour. Mm -hmm. And um, through that process, they noticed that I had a huge hypoglycemic episode in the third round. So I did not do well with the Mm -hmm. three hour. I wasn't diagnosed officially with gestational diabetes, but the endocrinologist said it was sort of up to me whether I want to be followed by her or not. And I did agree to this. So this was you know, a whole other journey that I didn't plan, of course. Um, But I was testing four times per day and doing all that good stuff. It was diet controls. We were, we were right along on track. Um, Baby was developing fine. I had my anatomy scan. I didn't mention that at 28 weeks and things looked great. Everything or 20, 20 weeks, things looked great. Everything was fine. And there was no need for, you know, for further um, testing at that time. However, because I had screened in for blood sugar level issues, this is kind of how I phrase it, they did want to watch baby's growth, right? So naturally, I was having a little bit more frequent ultrasounds. So anyways, pregnancy was going, me and my husband were super excited, getting everything ready. I had my baby shower. However, I will say mama's instincts are usually right. And a big part of my journey is really listening in and responding to that. So ever since I got pregnant with my daughter, things just 
didn't feel right. So I had anxiety before I've had depression before. So it was really, I feel like I had all the tools in my toolbox for, for managing that, but there was this gut instinct that something is not right. So the di diabetes came up and I'm like, oh, this must be it. Like, it's just that this is happening, right? There's the blood sugar. So anyways, I, and everybody was like, everything's fine, Kate, right? Of course I had wonderful support. So flash forward to 36 weeks and we go in for the last growth scan to just see like for induction, what are we doing here? And my husband, thankfully it was a Friday, my husband was able to come in and the tech was having a really hard time finding my daughter's the fetal heartbeat and positioning me in such a way to, to really look at everything. And so I remember it was like, turn here, turn there, right? All of those, the uncomfortableness at 36 weeks, mm -hmm. the discomfort. And um, she said, you know, I have to step out of the room and I'm just going to go chat with one of my colleagues. And even then me and my husband are like, okay, like things are okay. Like this, she, it's just that you're, you know, she said it's harder to get the results at this time. And, you know, cause you're, you're bigger and there's less amniotic fluid insert. So, and then somebody else comes in and she said, okay, again, I need you to lie on your side. And we're like, oh, right. Oh boy. And she paused and she looked at us and she said, so the baby's heart is on the other side of her chest. And immediately, right, you like white, like, what are you talking about? Right. And, and it's looking back, I'm like, okay, so we can fix that. Like, I know, I, I don't know. I know some people are born literally anatomically split, like that has to be it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and she said, we don't know what this is. This could be a tumor in the lung mass, right. It could be a lung mass in your child or it could be a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And we go, what the, what, what the heck? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia? And she says, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna get all the information you need. We need you to go home and we're gonna try to get you an appointment. And we're very lucky we're in Boston. We're gonna try to get you an appointment at Boston Children's Hospital, like right now to go to. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting there. We're waiting for the call. We get into the car and we're just like, what is that? Right. I'm calling my mom. I'm calling like all of my support systems. They think there's something with the, with me, like, okay, it must be hypertension or you're, you know, maybe you're, you know, going into early labor, we're coming. And I'm like, no, something's wrong with the baby. And we don't know what this is like, even then, right. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. So I get a call back. My doctor's office was very, um, I would say like they were very responsive and I get a call back and they say, we are so sorry, but they can't take you today, but we got you appointment for Monday. So we're sitting there. That's a yes. You're like, it's right. Yes. That's a million yes. years away. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And yes. And somebody should be calling you from children's to, to go over some of the possibilities. So again, right. And I'm predisposed to anxiety. My anxiety is going through the the roof yeah. of, I mean, all the things. Is my child going to survive? What even is this treatable? Is this not treatable? Am I do I have to be induced? Am I going into all of the things right that that moms in general think about all of the unknown and then this. So, we were very very lucky that there at Boston Children's Hospital there is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia clinic. So at this time it was likely That's that so specific. So specific to have a, a whole clinic for that. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah. But great. And yeah. yes. And I didn't even mention we live eight minutes at the time. We lived eight minutes to Ch Boston Children's Hospital. So like never in our wildest dreams did we think like we'd have to access this, yeah. right, at so soon. Yeah. However, it was there. So again, thanking our blessings, yet still, of course, the unknown. So at this time, they were like, I'm pretty sure we reviewed your scans and we are pretty sure that this is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. 
And we get a call from one of their absolutely amazing nurses. She's like one of their educational nurses that calls just to talk to parents who are in this exact same position of saying, what is happening to me? What is this? I've never even heard of this, right? Mm -hmm. Um, The acronym is CDH. So now it's just CDH. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But so she goes through all the, the education. She calls me. She says, how are you feeling? She gives me a space to talk and to cry right Mm -hmm. to just lay it all out there and I felt so incredibly again just grateful for that space and she said first and foremost do not google anything (laughs) yeah yeah yep and so of course I'm sitting there like well I already have it's been a year since I was waiting yes I I did on the car ride home when my husband was driving the car right so she says, we, we are here for you, right? This, we specialize in this. This is incredibly rare, yet we see it all the time, right? Uh-huh. So there's that dichotomy, like right. you've never heard of this yet. This is our everyday life. Yeah. And we're going to get you in on Monday. You're going to do a ton of scans and we're going to make a plan. Uh-huh. But everything stopped then, right? Yeah. All of the celebrations, like I always think about even my nursery wasn't complete. It was 36 weeks. My rock, like I hadn't even gotten a rocking chair, I remember. Mm-hmm. And that weekend, my parents came up and I remember my mom saying, we've got to get the rocking chair. We've got to get the rocking chair. And I, I have chills as I say this, because it was a symbol of, right, what is to come and and what we hope will be. Mm -hmm. And I just, I remember like, I can't that, I can't think about it. I just can't even go there. Mm -hmm. And I believe we did that week and we did eventually, but that weekend there was a lot of grief. There was a lot of anger. There was trying to fix things, something that I can't fix. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So you're just at this point, just waiting. Um, yeah. You have yep. a little bit of information, a little bit of mm-hmm. a direction, but really mm-hmm. everything is, else is kind of unknown. Yep. Yep. And I feel this is the piece that is not talked enough about. It's not talked about enough, right? Mm-hmm. That there's many birthing parents and partners that receive these absolutely life altering diagnoses right in utero and feel powerless mm-hmm. that's that is just the word I mean I, I remember going to the de- it's like the depths of my soul to just ask the why during this weekend of why is this happening did I do something the guilt the shame of of being the mother in this situation, being the birthing parent in the situation of, was it something I ate? Was it something mm-hmm. I did, right? Was it medications that I took? Mm-hmm. All of the, all of the questions. Um, and I remember one of the most visceral feelings was I just want to fix her. Mm. And I remember the shame around that because, you know, she's perfect. She's my child, but I just want to, to fix her. Mm-hmm. I just want to know that she is okay and that she's going to survive this. Mm-hmm. Yep. But right. <sighs> and still you're just kind of waiting. Yeah. There, there's yes. not, there's nothing yes. you can do that powerlessness um, yep. must just be ever present. Yep. Yes. Yes. And I know there, you know, it, it's funny. I think back on like 36 weeks, I, I went three weeks and I'll, I'll get to that where I was induced at 39, but it's like, I went three weeks and some moms go months, right. At, at the, you know, at the um, anatomy scan, that's just when this is usually diagnosed. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I just can't fathom the joy that's taken from you, right. The, um, or that I felt taken, you know, that it was taken from me of not mm-hmm. being able to enjoy those last moments, um, you know, carrying my daughter. So we, show up on Monday, we get to Boston Children's, it's a whole day of appointments, including an MRI. 
So I'm, I'll never forget that. So I'm 36 weeks and I'm going in to a children's hospital, going into a child MRI. So it's this little tiny. Oh. <laughs> so the mom, here's a whole other thing, right? You have to get it done because it's for the child. It's for your child, yeah. but you're at a children's hospital. Yeah. So you're going into facilities for children. So even the MRI is tinier and I'm 36 weeks and they're like, this is going to be really uncomfortable because you have to sit here for like an hour, right? Yeah. When you're so uncomfortable and I, yeah. I'm lying there and it's it's incredible what they can see. Like we still have the the MRI scans of seeing her little body inside mine and mm-hmm. it's it's incredible. But so we go through that, we go through cardiac testing um, and so to describe her heart. Yeah. So just to describe a congenital diaphragmatic diaphragmatic hernia is when there's an opening in the diaphragm and a lot, if not all of the organs from the bottom, okay, creep up into the chest cavity, impacting lung development. Mm -hmm. So many of these babies aren't born with really any lung capacity whatsoever. My daughter had a quarter of her left lung that was still there, like that had been enlarged. Because what happens in utero is our lungs expand, the sacs get bigger, all of those things, right? But her bowels were all the way up here. Mm -hmm. So this is what the MRI showed that, okay, it's bowels. It's not any, sometimes it's liver, sometimes it's the stomach spleen, everything is up there. And, um, and then they want to look at the heart because of course the heart's going to be impacted if the lungs are impacted. And we went through all of this. And then at the end of the day, this is a very long day. At the end of the day, they sit down with you and really create your birth plan slash post delivery plan for, for your daughter, for your child. And um, they try to give their best prognosis. That doesn't, you know, they try to say, I think this is good. You know, where I, think you might be here for three-ish weeks. I remember they said this is more mild because her opening was less large, meaning only the bowels went up, right? All of this medical stuff too that we're having to mm-hmm. to really wrap our head around and be informed about. Right. Um, all of a sudden. All of a sudden, so not, not knowing any of this. Yeah. Yes. So we made a plan. We talked with maternal fetal medicine, all of the specialists also for me, and made a plan for an induction at 39 weeks because with CDH, you're at risk for stillbirth. So they do want to make sure that their lungs have basically what they say is they're safe inside. They're the safest they are inside of you, right? It's the scary part when they exit. So, um, and how, oof, right? So you can just think about that, yeah. like the safety inside of you. And then once they, once they're out, yeah. Once they're a bird, that's scarier. Um, so we made that plan and 39 weeks rolls around and we're headed into the induction and we pull out, I always like to say, it's like you pull out all of the induction strategies, especially when it's your first born and you're only 39 weeks or you're not even full, not even at 40 weeks yet, or let alone 41 and two. And so I had an app. Unfortunately, I had a really horrible birth experience because the medical interventions just needed to be very invasive Mm. because my daughter was in trouble, right? So Mm. um, I also suffered birth trauma just from the constant poking, prodding, intervention, all of the checking, Mm. you know, um, her safety being at risk, not thankfully not mine. However, so we did it all. Like, I won't get into the details, but we really, you know, pulled, pulled out all the things. And I, I all of the it interventions, was from, all of the things yeah, all... for induction. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like for the, the in, fully, to, you know, yeah. the fully, the cervidil, the side attack, the, yeah, the, yeah, all of it. And the checks were so frequent because they're like, we got to get this baby out. So even the vaginal checks to me became traumatizing. We had to use ga- the 
is it nitrous or nitric for moms? I always forget the difference, but one of the two where it's just um, helps you a little bit relax into it. For I had to do that for a vaginal check because it got so bad that my body was just not allowing anything anymore. It was like, I am not, mm-hmm. no, nope, I'm not here. I'm not doing this anymore. And I just yeah. shut down. So after all this, they were working with me and um, finally get to uh, the pushing stage after I think I was like 48 hours. It was just like a two day, two and a half day process. So long. Yes. My 30th birthday, I would say I had like, I was 30 and I'm like, yeah, I celebrated like during my injection. Um, yes. Yes. Was in the hospital. It's so funny. I was like, this is typical. My daughter though. She's such a spitfire. I'm like, you made, you totally made that happen. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally. Um, and so, so this is when like the real prep work, I mean, of course they're prepping children's is waiting for her like for two days. And I know that. So they're all like checking in like her surgeon who we love so much would be coming in, checking on us. How are you doing? I'm like, still here, still on here not here yet Mm -hmm. they're all waiting like you know eagerly and uh so I finally get to pushing stage and I pushed for four hours I ended up with a high fever so I had the infection it was like 104.5 yes because of all the checking and all again I mean we needed to but I couldn't put like I literally lost of course I could not my energy I I remember passing out in between pushes because I was so feverish yeah yeah and so they said all right Kate we're gonna we gotta prep for we're gonna prep the OR that's the other thing is because I needed like 25 people in the room for the birth because she needed an entire NICU team And then I need, again, my own team Mm -hmm. that we need to even vaginal births need to be in the OR because there's not a room big enough. So they're, so they're waiting and she's like, we're prepping for a section, but I think you can do this. We're going to have to use a vacuum. That was another intervention. (laughs) So she's like, you know, we just got to get just, just enough there for me to use it. I was like, okay. Like I'm, I'm at, I'm at empty at this you point, zero right? Energy. Absolutely nothing left. And I yeah. finally got her there. And right at that point, they pushed, they moved me into the OR. Now I didn't even mention this. I was so lucky because this was prior to COVID. It was in 2019, um, March of 2019. And so my mom could be there and my husband. Mm. So this was like such a blessing. And I always think of all those CDH parents that went through this during COVID. Yeah. Oh, no. <sighs> yeah. So we were, we in, were in the OR and she, you know, I won't go into too much, but we, she was delivered. And then um, unfortunately CDH babies are immediately intubated. So like right from mom into the, onto the NICU team and they're like resuscitating and intubating. Um, this is part and of the I'm, plan that you already knew about. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. So this is all like, you can't touch them. Can't really quite frankly, can't like I, I, I looked at her and it was terrifying. So then I looked away because they're not healthy. Like immediately they can't breathe. Right. So she was white and not healthy and not, not scary, quite, you know, scary. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so she's off in the hands of these, these professionals that I don't know. Yeah. And my mom stays with me. And then my husband and the NICU team take her and her like the little, it's like rolling, like a rolling, you know, bed sort of incubator and roll her over the bridge into Boston Children's. So that's how that works. Mm. Then she's there. Then I'm still here, right? Mm getting stitched up I had a second degree from the vacuum and stitched up and all of the things that that then moms do right all of the like Mm -hmm. after stuff without your own baby yeah there yeah so at this point it's you your mom Mm -hmm. and then your team of people yes yes Mm -hmm. yep and yep go 
And so we go into the post, like typical, you know, the regular postpartum, um, I'm feeling okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm feeling physically exhausted, number one, right? Absolutely. It was 2 a.m. too, 2 a.m. when she was born. Um, so I'm exhausted. We're, we're doing like all that. I get transferred down to the postpartum floor again, like without my baby, my mom's there. And I have my husband basically calling me like with life, life altering decisions. So what, <laughs> so I'm on the phone, I'm like in the, the bed, right? And I'm talking to my husband on my, on my cell phone, exhausted. And he's like, this, ha this is happening. I don't know what, to... <sighs> so what we found out, we are always, we always knew this was going to be a rough ride, right? That it, she was going to be intubated. But during the time from post-birth intubation at into children's getting safe and stable, her lung, her good lung collapsed. So her only lung, mm -hmm. and it was a quarter, collapsed and was no longer functioning. So she was, oh yes, yes. So this is yep. your, your husband is like experiencing this as it's happening. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. Yes. Right in there with like, right. The emergency team as they're right. resuscitating. I don't know what they did like, but she de it. Right. She was so awfulness, all that trauma, all that trauma that my husband also physically seeing this. Um, and then our plan changing of, okay, so this is worse. Then remember the three weeks that now doubles and it's like, this is, yeah, you're not going home in three weeks. Like if, again, if she makes it, that's the thing about NICU life. And I feel like, especially with CDH life is I remember the doctors always saying, and, and it was probably, it was helpful, but it was hard to hear yeah. that every second things can change. So your hyper vigilant right. is constant yeah. because you are bearing, you are bearing for impact at all times. Like even in the good times, you are worrying that she will not survive. Um, so they, they tell you this ahead of time and uh -huh. the, the plan on a good day is, is what? Three-ish weeks in the, the NICU and, and then the home. NICU. Okay. Without uh -huh. surgical intervention? So they always need, still need surgery. Okay. I didn't even mention that. So you plan for surgery usually as soon as they are stable. Mm -hmm. Because you need to pull all of the stuff down, mm -hmm. sew up the, the hernia mm -hmm. or block it. Sometimes we use mesh. We, in the CDH community, it's called, it's like a mesh. Mm -hmm. um, to then allow hopefully the lungs to open at some point, right? For her, it was like, I think it's like the first two years of her life, her lungs were still opening mm -hmm. and they're still compromised. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point, it's like surgery is going to be delayed, of course, because now she's in very unstable condition and we're just going to, every second we're watching her. And it's like, so I sorry. haven't even seen her. Yeah, just so I understand, <laughs> like yeah. you're, you're going into this with best case scenario, delivery, mm -hmm. NICU, stability, surgery, recovery, yep. home in three weeks. Yes. yes. Best that case. seems fast, but okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. If, if, if they yeah. can do it, cool. <laughs> right. Okay. So then your, your, your husband is hearing all of this stuff about the lung collapse and mm -hmm. it's going to be at least double this yeah. now. Yeah. Um, and you, they are still working to just get her stable safe safe yep. stable okay yep. okay yes yep and then i'm still like recovering right so that i'm still recovering mm -hmm. and i have the antibiotics mm -hmm. so i have to be attached i felt like this was like i was in prison right mm -hmm. because i had to be attached for the iv i don't even remember i think it was twice a day you might like twice or three times a day for the antibiotics mm -hmm. so i couldn't leave to go see her whenever I wanted to, or to stay with her, I have to, you know, I'm still in postpartum. <laughs> yeah. Like I have my team and they were so good. Like, I remember 
they did let me like I would I took a wheelchair over to see her once I once I was able to which was just nice to just see her um but feeling like I was still being tied and then my husband having to do that independently was awful it, it's just yeah so he was pretty much there um at yes. the NICU uh and you guys are communicating by phone and maybe seeing each other sometimes yes yes okay. yes right yes <laughs> so fun so fun <laughs> um i'm glad you have a, a good sense of humor because damn right. that, it's crazy yeah uh, it it's, is it's a lot um, mm -hmm. okay so continue yeah so she is a, such a fighter number one i haven't even talked about my daughter yet but she is the epitome of a fighter mm -hmm. and she defies all odds i mean she really is such a and to this day she defies all odds so she just pushed through in a last minute sort of effort before ECMO, I don't know if you've heard of ECMO, but it's basically like a machine that you hook up to somebody to keep their body alive when there nothing is happening. So just to keep oxygenated. So a lot of CDH babies get hooked up to ECMO mm -hmm. and it's through, I'm like, don't want to get too graphic, but it's through like the jugular, it bypass, it like just moves the blood and then oxygenates. That's basically the only it's like a rest and digest for the body. Mm. Okay. Um, and we were prepared, like this could happen, but it's, there's so many, of course, there's so many side effects. There's infection risk. There's so much with ECMO. So in a last ditch effort, and this is where I get so confused. They gave her nitric or nitrous oxide. I always, the moms get one and then the, the babies get, I always forget, but I use this one. And then the um, the labor and delivery floor uses the other and it, it worked and it like really showed a lot of success with her. They weren't, you know, they were so thrilled with that because it doesn't always, and she was able, like we were in an okay place, okay place at that point. Um, and at this point I didn't even mention too, I'm pumping. So at that point I was like, I'm <laughs> pumping. I'm attached to the pump. I'm like, right. I'm like constantly and I'm attached to something okay. and I feel like it was the only thing. And I remember thinking, this is the only thing I can give her. And so it was like, that was my purpose. Right. That yeah. was my drive. I'm like, okay, you say it can do this eight to 10 times a day. I'm going to do this eight to 10 times a day. And I did it and I did it. Mm -hmm. And even then, like when she was intubated, I remember they would dip like the colostrum and put it like on her lips, her dry lips just because she can't there's nothing it was just yeah. um hydration at that point right she was getting IV, so um no nutrition nothing like that so again ups and downs I was pumping she was intubated like for around two weeks yeah. she stayed and we had one unsuccessful well, they didn't they didn't exactly extubate but they were ready to extubate and then she she just wasn't still wasn't ready so that was like one of the hardest things was just the waiting period and she would get infections we wouldn't know why mm -hmm. you know she had she stopped breathing in the middle of like times and they didn't know why so there's just so many questions right right so um again like uh, so how long are were you in postpartum recovery postpartum. so i think it was three days like okay. your typical two nights, three days. Uh -huh. Okay. And then after that, I mean, during mm -hmm. that time, when you can, you go to see mm -hmm. her. And yes. then after that, what happens? You live in the NICU now? Um, yes. Yep. So there's, and this is the other thing I didn't say. She's, I call it the NICU because that's how people understand it. But because she had surgery, oh, I didn't go over that. Mm -hmm. Because she had surgery, she was in the medical surgical ICU. Mm -hmm. So this is all ages mm -hmm. and only the CDH babies out of the babies are there. Because then there's heart ICUs, like for the cardiac, for the CHD years, but all only in that in the Masicu, it's the CDHers. So mm -hmm there's already that kind of isolation, mm -hmm. right? Of like, mm -hmm. who am I here? I'm not yeah. amongst like other parents going through this. Right. Um, we did have one little bay 
to sleep in, in that room. So only one of us could stay. And this to me was just the absolute worst part of the, I mean, it's all bad, but not being able to both be there at the same time overnight Mm -hmm. and just the constant switching of, it's like switching of the guard, right? Like who's going in today, who's going home or who's, they had a dorm type of room for parents that you could stay in if things were really critical. So we had that at the beginning where one of us could stay in the bay and then the other would be upstairs, like in the parent, we had like a parent dorm room type of setup. Mm. So we had that and we were switching. So surgery, I didn't mention that. So she finally got stabilized and then they're like, okay, there's How a long? pocket of time. How long it was happen? two days. Uh-huh two days. Mm -hmm. So that was good. That Mm -hmm. was, that was a good, you want to get there as soon as possible. Um, and the surgery went well. We were in the absolute best hands. We love our surgeon so much. She is like incredible, incredibly gifted, um, and compassionate in what she does. So that was, she's such an angel. Like I really say that she was so meant to be in our lives. Um, and she did a terrific job and we didn't have to use mesh. So she just sewed, sewed her right back up, <laughs> which reduces further complications mm-hmm. like of it reopening. And, um, and then it was again, after surgery, it's like go time. It's like, how are we going to, you know, get these lungs, you know, developed enough? How are we going to activate? How is she going to feed? How is she going to stay well? And, you know, like I said, she got infections. So it's not like you're out of the woods, basically, Mm -hmm. even, yeah, Mm post-surgery. So that's where we were. And like I said, it was two weeks that she was intubated. And then usually after that, they're working with you around feeding. She still has oxygen. So oxygen and then a um, NG tube for feeds. And I, we hadn't even, that's the other thing. We couldn't hold her until like maybe 10 days, 10 to 14 days. Mm-hmm. So already a lot of do, just due to like risk of infection or, um, I think it's, de- I think it was, yeah, I think it was just like stability. They don't want her to stress uh-huh. like any, any movement, right. even, even I remember her being weighed or anything like that, anything to risk. Mm. Like she would scream, she would cry, mm. right? And like, we couldn't do anything. No. And yes. yeah, yes. And there's another symbol. I always talk about my symbols through my journey, the rocking chair being one. Mm. The other is this hat. So she had this pink feather hat. It was like pink with like little, like <laughs> they just went off. Mm. And the bay would be behind her, right? So where we would like hang out, we'd be behind her and she would sleep a lot. Obviously she was sedated and a newborn. Um, but all we would see when she would be upset was her little hat going. Ding, 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 ding. And so it always like, I know it's like so cute, right? It's cute and really sad. But I just remember thinking like, oh, this hat, right? This reminder, we still have the hat today. And I'm like the the reminder of the time that you didn't have your voice, but I feel like we still, that was like her way of communicating. Like we still had this way of, okay, the, like the hat's moving, let's go like try to mm-hmm. shush her, try to calm her or else we would have no idea when she's screaming. Mm-hmm. And oh my gosh, the day of ex- extubation, we're like, so then the day comes when she's finally, hopefully stable enough to be, um, for the breathing tube to, to be removed. And I remember even then they say, I just want you to know that this could be put back in, you know, like there's always this. Don't get used to anything good. Yes. Yes. Like no celebration. Like where are the cell, where's the joy in any of this, yeah. right? Any of this. Right. Um, and I, I truly feel like that day was the I mean, it was miraculous and one of the most anxiety, I think it was the most anxiety provoking experience through the whole thing. Like I remember me and my husband were, cause they asked you to go in the hallway and we both like could barely stand because we were just so 
like holding our breaths in anticipation. And the second we, we heard her cry mm-hmm. and it's this scratchy, every Nick, you would understand this. It's this scratchy, like chicken, like, like it's a dinosaur baby mm-hmm. <laughs> sounding noise. And it's the absolute best thing that you'll ever hear. Mm-hmm. And she was bright. She was pink. She was like, she looked perfect. And it was our first shot. I don't know, it's the first picture without her, without anything at that time. Yep. Yeah. And your first time really hearing her. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she has the loudest voice and she's the loudest person. <laughs> <laughs> so time. now, yeah. And so now we're like, Claire, do you know that there were times when we couldn't, I mean, we don't go to that extent, but it's just funny because she just loves her voice and uses it all the time. She nice. won't stop talking. Oh, nice. Yep. <laughs> so we get at that point it's again it's like nurturing it's making sure that she's growing and figuring out breastfeeding and bottles and all of that like all of the normal struggles that parents go through but for cdh babies they're working extra hard mm-hmm. like they're working really hard just to breathe so feeding in caloric intake right is a massive challenge yeah um, so we worked very closely with dietitians at that point, you get moved to another floor, another unit, um, and they weigh, they weigh her all the time. It's very number based, right? So once again, it's this control, which absolutely is necessary, but as yeah. parents, it's like, well, what are we doing here? Right. What, uh-huh. what's our role? What are we, what are we doing? Um, I remember to feed her, we'd have to buzz the nurse. So like, even if she was hungry, like if she was hungry, you know, it was like, I can't help you. I have to wait. We have to weigh you. We have to. So that's Mm -hmm. hard, really hard. The the nurses are monitoring the feeds. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they like have to, right. They have to watch you. Um, if you breastfeed, you have to weigh before and after to make sure she was getting enough volume. And even then she had to be fortified times like a thousand. So I couldn't breastfeed solely. It was just for like my experience and hers, but it was not enough. Mm. So I was still pumping and then I would give the milk to them to fortify with formula. And then they would come in and prepare the bottle. Mm-hmm. And then we would feed and we would help her, but there was, you know, choking. She's not used to this. So that's, it's hard. And then like the balance between the NG tube and oral feed. So we would do kind of a combination of those two. Right. Right. Cause she's, lot. I mean, she's um, still having challenges with breathing. So like feeding yes. and breathing at the same yes. time is exhausting. Is it, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah like a chat impossible I mean, if you can't breathe and feed right so it's it's a constant but that they want her to of course orally feed yeah. at some point so you're slowly introducing new things yeah. she still has the oxygen by the way for a long time almost before discharge we were going to discharge with oxygen mm-hmm. um but she was she rallied and she did well um but that yeah that, that's a long one. I feel like that part of the journey almost feels longer mm-hmm. because you're, you're ready. You're not really necessarily hypervigilant as much mm-hmm. as you were in the acute stages, but you're just, you just want to be a mom. Like you mm-hmm. just want to be a parent. Yeah. Um, and yet you're still, you know, you're still under the, you're still under the medical care that, that your daughter needs. Um, how long did, was the NICU stay? So she was officially in the hospital for six weeks. Oh, so estimates mm-hmm. right on. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have that down pat. They're like, as many weeks, it's so funny, as many weeks as you're in the ICU, double that, and that's your long. So you'll do, if we were three ICU and then three step down, mm-hmm. and it really was quite close in measure and estimate. So, okay. yep. Uh, all right. So uh, how are you doing through this mm-hmm. whole time? Like, mm-hmm. are, are you in survival mode? You, are you mm-hmm. even aware of how you're doing? Like mm-hmm. what, mm-hmm. what happened? I am absolutely in tunnel vision. 
Like I am in survival mode. I have the best support system yet they would be checking in and I really couldn't even talk about anything outside of I'm fine. Like I, I, if it wasn't about, if it wasn't until the end, like I couldn't talk, it was total survival. So it was like, until she's out of here, mm-hmm. I can't talk. Right. Like I can't be happy. Right. I can't find any pleasure. I can't take care of myself until she's out of here. Yep. So it was total brace for impact the entire time. Yeah. And I had a therapist. I didn't even say, but I, I, I am a therapist. I believe in therapy. Like I had mentioned, I have anxiety and depression. I have a history of that. So I was like really prepped. And I remember even canceling my therapy appointments mm-hmm. because I just was like, I'm here and in the hospital. Like I, I don't want to take a therapy appointment in the hospital. Like it mm-hmm. just, nothing felt right. Mm-hmm. I just wanted her out. Yep. And I was, yeah. Tunnel vision. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. And then you get the news that you can leave and Mm -hmm. you get home. And then how do you feel? Yeah. Then it's like, what do we do now? Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, it's extra. um, At that point, it's like the feeding and she had tremendous GERD. She had really, really bad GERD. So again, it was constantly feeding. I was continuing to be very much in survival mode. So I think that looking back, that's one of the saddest parts to me is we left and she's quote unquote safe. And yet they're still saying for two years, she needs to be extremely careful with germs, with like a common cold could be life threatening. And so it's, oh my gosh, like why can't, right? Like how is, this isn't fair. Like she, we're, we did all this work and now we're here with a newborn at home and we can't, again, there's simples, just like even the simple joys are kind of ripped, ripped away from you. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I still don't feel like I was being honest with myself Mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And my husband, we were so grateful. He had a long paternity leave and was able to stay home and like support me and, and us, you know, coming home, all three of us together. And I, I'll never forget though. I, I feel like I was actually thinking about work as an escape. Mm-hmm. I remember thinking like, I just want normal again. Yeah. I just want some resemblance of my old life back again, because mm-hmm. this is terrifying. This isn't fun. Um, my daughter also to me was a big trigger. Mm-hmm. This is also, I don't feel talked uh, you know, about enough that for birth trauma and for a lot of ICU parents, your child in and of itself can be triggering. Mm -hmm. And so for me, my anxiety was so high. I couldn't be alone with her. I couldn't be her primary caregiver. My husband really stepped in to do a lot of that. Um, I I had a hard time soothing her. I had a hard time holding her. Mm -hmm. And this went on for a long time, Mm -hmm. like too long. Um, even after my husband went back, I, I would, I stayed home with her and I was doing minimal hours as a, as a therapist at night. So when my husband came home, I would go into work. And so I was with her most of the day. And I remember just feeling trapped. I was like trapped inside of the home. I didn't want her being exposed to anything again, of course, then COVID came, but I didn't want her in harm. And she was struggling and she was still an anxious baby. Like she was loud. She was on feeling on sick. She was regulating, right. Her nervous system needed to be regulated. And so she was, it was tough. It was like, I can't go to a coffee shop with her. It's not like a normal baby. She is very, she's uncomfortable a lot of the time. So I was stuck at home. It wasn't until like six months that I called my OB. And I remember saying, I am not well. I'm thinking about leaving. I'm thinking about like driving cross country. Like I just had this feeling of like, I need to leave. Yeah. And they said, I'm so glad you called. I need you to come. Like what we encourage you to come in. You can meet with our nurse practitioner. And I was like, okay. And so I come in and the nurse practitioner, unfortunately wasn't very helpful. She talk to me about med she didn't ask me any assessment questions so like even as a therapist I'm like okay you don't even not asking any of these (laughs) 
And she, and she looked at me and said, I can prescribe you meds. This is where I would send it. Like, what's your pharmacy? And I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready for that. And she's like, she said, what is it about you moms? <gasps> oh, no, she didn't. Oh, yeah, she did. What is it about you moms and meds? She works in a pediatrician's <laughs> office? Yeah. No, it was OB. It OB's was OB and P. Oh, oh, right, right. Yes. OB's office. Oh, my goodness. All right, lady. Yeah. So I'm like, thankfully, again, as a therapist, I'm like, okay, I know better. Like, <laughs> I was still seeing my therapist, too, mind okay. you. Um, and I give it, like, another three months. Miserable. And then I finally call a prescriber. I was like, led to this prescriber and I find my way to her. And like, she does a beautiful assessment. Like I feel heard, I feel listened to. And we did, I did start medication, which I've been on a lot of my life. And it, that was comfortable for me um, because I was heard, right? Because I was given a choice because I was yeah. given other options. And I felt so much better and upward, really upwards from there. Like mm-hmm. things got better. I found help. I understand like the trauma as trauma. I understand what I went through in a whole new light. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's happy. She's health, health, so healthy. I'm happy and healthy and yeah. Glad. I'm so happy to be here really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah. I mean, it's quite a journey and you said, I mean, we didn't get into it, but there's the whole, like, she was about one year old when COVID hit or something yes. like that. So yeah. that's its own uh-huh. ball of whatever to deal with. Um, and so how old is she now? She's four going almost four and a half. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she's such a bright light. She is an energizer bunny we like to say she is healthy she still needs like she still has pulmonary hypoplasia so like the insides of her lungs are still a little compromised so like through the winter time she sometimes needs inhalers and she gets checked at children's once a year but other than that she's like a healthy and happy child loves school loves learning loves running around and doing all the things that she should be doing so and she can be active um, yes. Like literally yes, run they, around. Yes. They do a, uh, sh- it's so cute. This winter they'll have her get on like a treadmill and they do a, like a toll test to see how is she oxygenating when she's running just because she'll be turning five and like more formal sports. You know, like she tried soccer and sometimes has to take breaks. Like she'll come back and be like, mom, I need a water break. But, and like, she knows, <laughs> like, she's mm-hmm. just like, I'm tired. I'm like, yeah, of course. Let's, yeah, it's tiring. Mm-hmm. Um, but as long as like, she's comfortable, they're com- like her providers are comfortable and we're comfortable. Um, and hopefully she'll be able to do any and all that she can't think that she wants to do That's in the great. future. That's mm-hmm. great. So mm-hmm. great. She's got her healing and and recovery down and Mm -hmm. I assume you're on the same trajectory yes very (laughs) much so yes (laughs) and and can I ask how your husband's doing great question he also is doing well um he found his own way I feel right as we all do um he but he's getting there I would say he's getting there just like I'm getting there and it's it's important to just stay in open communication about it like I even feel at four years we now look back and we're talking about it differently than I think right than we had um and I think that's been so healing to just say look at each other and say we went through that yeah. Like we 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 would like we went through that yeah. and for both of us to be like wow yeah like yeah. finally taking the deep breath mm-hmm. you know it feels really good it feels really good um and just yeah just what knowing you, we had each other's back so in, in what do you well, uh, i guess what what helped you get mm-hmm. through this like looking back mm-hmm. on all of that mm-hmm. so one of my biggest takeaways to such a challenging place in my life is 
faith and spirituality. Um, I grew up really against faith. I grew up like not really understanding what this all means, right? Like I, I was born into a Catholic household, but it wasn't very strict. It was like, go to church if you want to go to church. But one of the biggest takeaways has just been my connection to something else, my connection to feeling connected in any, in all respects. So whether that be through other people, whether that be through God, spirit, whatever, you know, whatever terms you want to use, really having faith that you are not alone and that also that your intuition and your gut, you know, your gut is, is there for you as a compass, mm -hmm. as a guiding light along the path. Um, as I said, it was like, there were so many things that helped me and also understanding, looking back, oh my goodness, I had some of those, like I had that inner knowing, but I couldn't describe it. But that was almost comforting after being like, okay, I knew, I knew, I know, I know this is going to be okay. I know I'm going to be okay. Um, just trusting. It's like the deep surrender when you're in the darkest of places, just knowing that you're not alone, you're supported, you're connected. And first and foremost, like you have yourself, right? You have you, you have your own soul, your own spirit, your own sense of self that really guides you in the hardest of moments. And it's always there and it's always communicating. We just have to pause and listen. Mm -hmm. And that's the hardest thing in trauma, right? I mean, I wasn't necessarily, I, ha I remember I had times where I'd be like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Or like, okay, I recognize that I can feel that, but that is so hard to do when your nervous system is firing and your mind is in a whole different place. You're not feeling centered. You're not feeling grounded and you're certainly not feeling connected. So that's been something I just, I am religious about is connecting, meditating, finding that solace, like within my own self mm -hmm. and listening, listening to me above all mm -hmm. is a huge takeaway mm -hmm. from this. Yeah. And it sounds like you've, you could get like glimpses of that here and there and like hold uh -huh. on to it in parts. Uh -huh. uh, even if you couldn't really like sit into yeah. it fully. Yep. Um, so obviously you've been through it. Um, this, and this is uh, a lot, a lot. No, nobody's like ready for this. Um, uh -huh. You just go through it if and if and when it happens. Um, but for, for other people who maybe are going through this um, or who are learning about um, an in your neurodiagnosis, what, what can you say to them? I just feel first and foremost, knowing you're not alone. It's not your fault that there are, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You will see it. You will find it. But take care of you, take care of your bodies, take care of your body, because our body is an incredible vessel, right? Used to be here. But when we are moving through these things, it's almost impossible to connect in the ways we need to connect. So find the things that ground you, find the things that center you and that create hope and create some forward movement, you know, moving through the some whatever inspiration, you know, and wherever you get that inspiration, cling on to that. But remember, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. There's always somebody to talk to. And always, um, there's always movement, but you will get through this and you're stronger than you would ever imagine you are. Right. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, th thank you for that. And, um, and sharing your experience and sharing about this diagnosis and, um, you know, how you and, and your husband got through this. And I'm so glad that your daughter is doing well. Thank that you're doing Thank well. you. Us too. Very appreciative. Thank you so much. You can connect with Kate on Instagram at Kate Stakem. On Facebook, Kate Stakem, L-I-C-S-W, and her website, katestakem.com. And Kate also shared a website with me that um, she'd like to share with you as well. 
tinyhero.org is a website where you can learn more about congenital diaphragmatic hernias and the work that that nonprofit is doing to help families. And please do join me on Instagram at mom and mind. And if you didn't know yet, this podcast is also on YouTube where you can see our conversation and be happy to have you join us on YouTube and on Instagram. And please do share and like these episodes so that more and more people can see them and know that they are not alone. It's really the best way to support this work. Thank you so much until next time.